Hello, welcome to our webinar on the implications of natural disasters on U.S. agriculture, brought to you by CFAIR, that is the Council on Food, Agriculture, and Resource Economics. My name is Jane Kolodinsky, and I am a CFAIR board member and a professor at the University of Vermont. It is truly my pleasure to be moderating today's webinar. It's CFAIR's mission to translate high-level research and knowledge to a diverse audience that includes policymakers, elected officials, and federal administrators. When we demonstrate the value of the profession to these groups, the Council increases public appreciation for research, extension, outreach, and academic programs in agricultural and applied economics. Before we get started, I'd like to provide some background on today's topic. Farmers, foresters, and ranchers are unfortunately familiar with the devastation and loss of life and property accompanying a natural disaster caused by an extreme weather event such as a hurricane, drought, or flooding. Although natural disasters have been a threat since the early 20th century, they've become more severe and frequent due to recent climatic changes affecting winds, ocean temperatures, and precipitation patterns. These changes facilitate more destructive and impactful weather events. Thus, current U.S. federal farm policy focuses on risk management. The projected spending for the federal crop insurance program exceeds all other farm-related programs authorized in the 2018 Farm Bill. This webinar discusses the effect of these extreme weather events on agriculture and the challenges for policymakers in ensuring federal programs assist farmers with their demanding high risk management needs while also facilitating adaptation to a changing climate. We are pleased to have assembled a panel of three experts to discuss their work, starting with Mark Brusberg. Mark Rusberg serves as the Chief Meteorologist of USDA's Agricultural Weather and Assessments Group, a component of the World Agricultural Outlook Board. He helps to coordinate the activities of USDA, USDA agencies and, and is responsible for weather and climate related issues and serves as a liaison with other organizations having similar interests. Welcome, Mark. Bruce McCarl is a University Distinguished Professor Professor of Agricultural Economics at Texas A&M University. His recent research efforts have largely involved policy analysis, mainly on climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, water economics, ENSO analysis, and Edwards aquifier water, as well as the proper application of quantitative methods to such analyses. Welcome, Bruce, and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to understanding what ENSO means. Chuan Hong Pham is a senior actuary with USDA Risk Management Agency, the RMA. Her previous government positions include Deputy Director for Data Management, Market and Trade Economics at the Economic Research Service, that's ERS, and Statistician in the Actuarial Branch of RMA. Prior to returning to USDA, she was an Associate Professor and Program Director of Business Intelligence and Analytics at Rockhurst University in Kansas City. Welcome, Juan. Before we start, we wanted to explain how to ask questions during the webinar to make sure that you, the audience, knows how to engage. During the webinar, you can put questions to one or all of the speakers by typing it into the box in the control display accessed by clicking on the question dropdown, as shown on the slide, and sending it to the organizer. We're ready to begin our webinar. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, uh, Jane, for that nice introduction. And thanks again to CFAIR and the organizers for inviting me to talk to you today. I'm the chief meteorologist here at USDA's Office of the Chief Economist. And I just wanted to take a moment, not just to talk about natural disasters, but as Jane mentioned, uh, some of the challenges that we might face uh, as we go into uh, a future that is unknown for a lot of us. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to start uh, just by talking about uh, some of the potential weather and climate uh, occurrences that can be catastrophic 
for our nation's uh, farmers, ranchers, and foresters. And this is a sample uh, from the uh, National Centers for Environmental Information, and it shows what they classified as billion-dollar weather disasters. And you see a great deal of diversity across the country. You see hurricanes and tornadoes in the southeast, uh, ice storms, uh, derechos, which are strong wind events in the Midwest. And then you start to see some of the longer term creeping disasters, as we sometimes call them, including drought and the risk of fire, uh, uh, wildfires. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is a story taken from September of 2022. And it talks about some of the longer term impacts from some of these uh, weather and climate disasters. This particular story is talking about how ranchers had to cull their herds. And a lot of times this goes overlooked. Uh, when you have a short term disaster, like a flood or uh, you know, a hurricane, uh, wind event, there can be agricultural damage and unfortunately catastrophic impacts such as loss of life and infrastructure. But a lot of times there's insurance to cover that. Some of these longer term features are actually causing people to change the way they do business. If you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see this particular event, um, and this is from the height of the drought in August of 2022, you see that just over half of the nation's cattle were in areas impacted by drought. If you go to the next chart, you see that it's not just the cattle, but it's also the hay, it's the feed. And while these do overlap quite a bit, what this means is some of the areas where uh, farmers who are facing severe drought may have been able to get feed um, were not able to get feed, or they may have to travel longer distances to do that, which costs them money and cuts into the bottom line. The next chart shows the percentage of hay located in drought over a 12 month period. And you can see that uh, this was ongoing for about a 12 month period. And depending on the part of the country that the producers are from, uh, this did cut into some of the prime rainy, you know, the, some of the, some of the uh, most important times of the year, if you will, to grow biomass. We saw that in some of the spring droughts in the Northern Plains where even though there was abatement of drought, uh, the dryness hit right at the wrong time for them to grow their hay. Now, the next chart shows, uh, illustrates some of the USDA disaster relief programs. And we look at this as a safety net for farmers. And we do use the drought monitor as a trigger. Uh, this is just a sample of some of the pro programs, uh, excuse me, the programs that do use uh, the drought monitor as a trigger mechanism. And the drought monitor, you know, in just the livestock forage protection program uh, has triggered over $8 billion of aid to our producers. Now, if you go to the next page of this pamphlet, and I encourage everybody to visit my links and they can get this information firsthand, uh, you see that USDA does also have some mitigation and resilience programs where they're putting into the land, uh, you know, mechanisms or, or they're adopting new procedures to help them become more resilient to drought. And they're going to need it. I mean, it, it, it's not a rosy picture with climate change in some of those drought afflicted parts of the country. If you go to the next slide, I'm going to start talking about the findings of the, um, you, you know, the uh, long term climate change assessments. To start off with, however, 
this is all, another product from our friends at NOAA showing what has happened over the last 30 years. Now, we're in the midst of a mega drought in the West, so it's not surprising that we've seen drier and normal weather over the last 30 years. But if you skip to the next slide, you see that the national, the fourth national climate assessment is depicting warmer than normal conditions uh, intensifying even in some of the lower uh, warming scenarios. So we're expecting there to be a general warming trend over North America, uh, you know, by the middle part of the 21st century. The next slide shows the expected intensity or uh, frequency increase of high temperatures. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see high temperatures above 90 degrees. On the right-hand side, you see the number of days below 32 dropping. Now, this does offer some opportunity for farmers. Um, not only is it getting a little bit warmer farther north, but they're also anticipating a longer growing season. So that could be some opportunities for folks, but again, they're going to have to get through the uh, potential increase in heat. And the next slide shows not only an increase of precipitation, but also potential increase in uh, excessive rainfall. It's not just the rainfall and temperature, however, it's also the way the Earth is uh, transferring energy from the equators to the poles. Slide 13, the next slide, has a uh, image of the polar vortex. And a lot of times it, 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 it isn't intuitive, but we're seeing that the impacts of the warmer weather is also disrupting excuse me, disrupting the flow at the polar region. That is helping to explain some of the incursions of the bitter Arctic. You know, we, uh, along the East Coast, we've heard the term uh, polar vortex being invoked. This is what this means. So the more warming that you have in the polar region, the more instability you have. And uh, if you advance to the next chart, this uh, is a snapshot of a cold weather outbreak in February of 2021. And looking again at livestock, you see that not only was there bitter cold all the way down to the Rio Grande Valley, but there were several days of deep snow. Not only did that stress livestock, uh, it caused the producers to move their livestock, but also there were losses in power and at least locally, this impacted some of the, the chicken and egg producers in the country. When they lose power during the cold, then they can't heat uh, the coops. Uh, there was also disruption in transportation, et cetera. So really, um, this is just you know five minutes or so of saying some of the things that we can we can see that have already happened how this can get worse in the long run, and really underscoring the need for us to take a close look at how we do things. Maybe that safety net is going to have to be expanded so that people can be more prepared for some of these extreme events. Um, I'll stop it there. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, when I talk about livestock being stressed, this is the picture I think of. Uh, I certainly would be stressed as well if I look like that. Um, and again, uh, if you have any questions, please re reach out to me. I apologize uh, for not being in the room, so to speak, with you. I'm on my cell phone. Hopefully, that will clear up in the uh, next few minutes and I can answer any questions. So thank you once again, and I look forward to taking any questions you might have. Thank you, Mark Brusberg, for your presentation. All I want to say is, wow, there's nothing like really clear illustrations to bring home the point that uh, is found in complex data. I just want to remind everyone to send questions to the organizer using the question drop-down menu. Next, we'll be hearing from Bruce McCarl. Uh, 
Um, good morning, although I guess it's afternoon to most of you. I thought a little bit about what I'd say about disasters, and I was going to say something about hurricanes, but I'm not going to quite get there given the six minutes. So could I have the next slide, please? Um, the companion chart to the one Mark showed is the evolution of these billion dollar events that are climate related over time. And as you can see from here, I think 2021 was our all time, no, 2020 was our all time peak high. Um, 2022 is actually higher than it looks over there. We've had a rise in these events over time. Um, and a lot of them are agriculturally related. You can see in that picture, it has droughts and wildfires and flooding and winter storm freeze counts and severe storms and then hurricanes. So could I have the next one, please? Um, one thing, if you're a climate change person, when I first started this work in the 80s, I didn't know what was going on or really believed that much was happening. But at this stage, this is the projections from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And you can see that what we've seen so far is about one degree warming. But what this picture shows is that under the future greenhouse gas projections, which are those various red to blue colored lines, that there's pretty much very little difference between those up to about 2040 or 2050 meaning that we're about to see one more degree of warming regardless of what we do about carbon control and that sort of leads to the statement that you ain't seen nothing yet so let's look at a few things that have happened so can you give me the next slide please well climate change and disasters there certainly can be disasters that are hotter conditions more extended drought, stronger hurricanes, more fires, more intense rainfall, more floods, less yield growth, more variability, altered El Nino, ENSO, which is El Nino Southern Oscillation, and then altered disease risk. I've worked on most of these except for fires, and I'll show a couple of examples. Next slide. So the first thing I want to talk about is hotter conditions. Now, conceptually, if we take a crop and shove it in a freezer, it's going to die. If we shove it in a fire, it's going to die. In between is this sort of U -shape, inverted U-shaped optimum level. Um, the Schlenker and Roberts and some of the folks working here for me studied what that curve looks like for corn and that's this lower picture here and what's notable in the picture is on the far right notice when the temperature go, this average growing season temperature goes much above 30 degrees centigrade which is i think what is that 86 degrees fahrenheit that the corn yield drops off dramatically so if we see a hot growing season like we had, I believe in the Midwest in 2012, we would expect that this would constitute some sort of a disaster. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing that I wanna talk about a little bit is alterations in the El Nino, La Nina cycle. Um, in the long run, according to meteorologists, the La Nina events are supposed to happen about one fourth of the time and El Nino events about one fourth of the time and neutral about half the time. And in um, a few years ago, somebody projected that warmer conditions would lead to El the La Nina probability raising up to about one third, similarly El Nino and the neutral probability dropping down to one third. I looked the other day at some data, I was gonna include this chart, but six of the last 12 years have been La Nina years. Three of them have been El Nino years. So we're, we're running with a more probable La Nina in the short run, 
although that's not exactly a good place to measure this long-term climate change. When we look at that and what it costs agriculture to have more frequent La Nina and El Ninos and ones that are stronger, which was also part of the projection, it costs between three and $400 million if we get them more often and between up, up around a billion dollars if we get them more frequently. And this in fact exceeds the cost of climate change as I've projected it in some other work. So this change in variability is likely more significant than the change in, in the climate per se. Okay, next slide, please. Um, also, I wanted to just show a little bit about hydrology. The Edwards Aquifer is a major aquifer that supplies uh, water for endangered species. It also supplies water for an important agricultural industry around Uvalde, Texas, which is a name you've probably unfortunately heard recently. And then it's the main water source, or was at least for the city of San Antonio. And you can see here that um, up until around 1990, that Edwards Aquifer was increasing in how much recharge it was receiving. But since 1990, it's been decreasing. And also in that subsequent to 1990 period, we see a lot more variability. We see a lot more sort of bad low events and big high events and more variance around that line. Um, next slide. This one, I didn't really want to call a disaster, but I wanted to show you because I think it's pretty important. If we look at the rate of growth in U.S. corn yields from 1950 to 2022, we get about two bushels per year on average over that whole time period. However, if we look at it between 1950 and 73, we're getting 2.6 or so. Between 75 and 2011, we drop a little bit under two. And since 2013, we're dropping down to a little bit under one. This to me is not an immediate disaster, but is certainly an emerging disaster. This technical progress is slowing down. We've done some work that shows climate's having an effect on this. So are R&D investments. And we're seeing this slowing, which really portends dramatic things for US consumers and livestock producers and um, others. Next slide, please. The final slide that I'm going to cover is we've all heard about eggs in Iowa and avian influenza. Well, about 10 years ago, I guess I sold you, sent you the old slides because this doesn't have the reference down at the bottom of the page. But um, about 10 years ago, we did some work on what happens under climate change, avian influenza outbreaks. And just to make things uh, to the point, it shows an increase in the probability of avian influenza outbreaks and may be in part contributing to what we're seeing with egg prices and, and layers in the Midwest. So with that, I am done and turn over to the next. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, lots of food for thought. Uh, for for us and the audience today. Our last presenter is Juan Pham. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitations to come and share some of the basic information and highlights about the federal crop insurance program with the CFAIR um, audience today. Next slide, please. So I want to begin today discussions about the federal crop insurance program by highlighting the key objective. So the federal crop insurance program have three major objectives. The first objective is to provide effective risk management products to America farmers and ranchers. And the second is to increase participation into the program by expanding coverage to more commodities and then into new geographic areas where it is reasonable to do so. 
And the third one, and it's a very important one, is actual soundness. This is mandated by Congress in the Federal Crop Insurance Act, and it requires that the Federal Crop Insurance Program must establish premium rates to cover all the projected losses in the program and a required reasonable reserve for catastrophic events. Next slide, please. So the Federal Crop Insurance Program is a public-private partnership, and this chart here shows that the delivery system reflects this attribute. The program itself is managed by a board of directors, and the board of directors delegate the day-to-day -day operations to the risk management agency. RMA has approximately about 400 employees, and as an agency, we have oversight of compliance. We have oversight over risk management education and outreach. And we also have oversight over, over product management. However, the risk management agency does not sell, nor do we service individual insurance policy. This is done by a set of private insurance company that are authorized to do so, and they're called Authorized Insurance Provider, or, I, or AIP. The relationship between RMA, the Federal Crop Insurance Program, and these private companies are spelled out in the standard reinsurance agreement. There are approximately 8,000 insurance agents and 5,000 loss adjusters who sell and service over 1 million insurance policy to American agricultural producers on an annual basis. Now, the Federal Crop Insurance Program is designed to be dynamic and flexible to meet changes in the needs of American producers, especially in a time when we are thinking about changes in agricultural technology, in agricultural risks and agricultural practices. And this can occur in one of three ways. The first way is through legislations, so such as the Farm Bill. So Congress can require that RMA de develop or establish new program in, as part of, of um, the Farm Bill. Secondly, RMA can also lead its own initiative to develop or make changes to the federal crop insurance program. And this is often um, from feedback that we receive from stakeholder and that stakeholder can vary across the board. They can come from um, individual producers, they can come from organizations, they can come from uh, congressional offices, etc. And the last way in which new, new program and changes to the program can be introduced to federal crop insurance is by a unique process called the 508H process. This is a private submission process where anyone in the private sector can propose um, changes to the existing federal crop insurance program or to develop a new program. And there are standards that need to be met. And if the board approve, approve of that concept proposal, the stakeholder can receive um, advanced funding to develop the program. And then there are more standards to meet, but, you know, but if they can meet those standards, it will be implemented into the program. Next slide, please. So crop insurance is developed to insure for losses due to natural causes. And in the next slide, I'll kind of share with you some of those, those um, natural causes. And this is why typically crop insurance is referred to as multiple payroll coverage insurance or MPCI insurance. The program is designed so that producers can choose different coverage level starting with the most basic, which is, which is catastrophic coverage, where the federal government pay the full premium and producers only have to pay an administrative fee. After that, producers can choose to buy up their coverage starting from 50 to 85%, and they can increase that coverage in 5% increment. The most common plan of insurance purchase in the federal crop insurance program are yield protection. This is where we insure a producer's yield against their historical averages. And then there are also the other two very popular programs are revenue protections and revenue protection harvest price exclusion, which is very similar to our yield protection program, but there is an added price protection components. Next slide, please. So just to provide some statistics that speak to the reach of the federal crop insurance program as a farm safety net program. I've included some statistics here for you to see. In the year 2000, approximately about 300 crop varieties were insurable by the federal crop insurance program. In 2022, that stood at 604 crop varieties. 
Today, 87% of all the planted acres for major fuel crop in the United States are insured by crop insurance. Approximately 81% of planted acres of vegetable are also insured by crop insurance. The percentages for planted acre for fruit and tree nut is 65%. And then for pasture, rangeland, forage, and hay is approximately 33%. Next slide, please. This chart here shows losses that have been paid to producers who participate in a federal crop insurance program in the last two decades between the year 2001 through 2022. And they've been broken up by causes of loss. And what you see here in this chart is about 43% of payments that have been made to producer for cover costs of loss in the program in the last two decades is due to drought. Another 31% is due to excess precipitation, flooding, and storm. The way I think about this is that the major causes of loss in the federal crop insurance program is either due to too little water or too much water. And then the other approximately 27% of losses has been due to cold weather, diseases, insect, hail, changes in price, and then there's this other category that can include everything from wildfires to smoke damages to volcanic eruption, et cetera. Next slide, please. To find more information about the Federal Crop Insurance Program, you can visit us on our website. It's rma.usda.gov. And when you come to our home website, there's a two tool that I just want to quickly highlight to the, to the CFA audience. The first one is the agent locator tool. And that's the tool where you can put in your address and it will provide you with a list of crop insurance agent in your area that you can contact to learn more about your options. And the second tool is the summary of business tool. And this one is very popular with academic audiences and policy advisor and policy maker because it provides the latest information about the federal crop insurance program for that particular crop year. And that can include total liability, total losses, and total premium paid. Thank you very much.